Professor Dame Laura Serrant wears many hats. She is an award-winning international speaker focusing on global diversity, leadership and inclusion. She is a professor of community and public health nursing and in 2018 was awarded the OBE for services to nursing and community health and public health policy. She is listed, deservedly so, amongst the top 100 most influential black people in the UK. It is my privilege, honour and pleasure to introduce Professor Laura Serrant. Laura, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you. Would you kindly tell us about some of your origins, beginning with your parents? My parents came to the UK in the early, late 50s, early 60s. And I say two dates because like many Caribbean families, my father came first and then my mother came a little bit later. Um, I am the middle child in a large family. And most of my childhood up to the age of seven or eight, I lived in an area of Nottingham called the Meadows, which was, um, which sounds beautiful. It sounds like you're, you know, it's fields and daisies and whatever. <laughs> but the Meadows was what the part of the slum area of Nottingham in the 70s, 60s, 70s um, era. And um, there were back-to-back -back terraces. The, um, the house, very typically, as you would see in, in the kind of match stalk streets, you know, the back-to-back -back terraces, the roads, the toilet was outside. Um, there was no bathroom in the house and the houses backed onto um, a munitions fa large munitions factory, um, which was there. There were a lot of people who were sick. There were a lot of people who, you know, across the road from us, across from our front door, there was a, an Irish family that had seven girls. And their father, their dad, who I thought was quite old, who actually really couldn't have been, because thinking about the age of the girls, um, he was forever coughing. I remember him coughing all the time. And I remember saying to my mum once, why is Mr. So-and-so, why is he always coughing? And she goes, oh, he's just got a bad chest. And I think, oh, right, okay. But there were lots of people who coughed. That's one of the things. But then now I think living in that area with the factory and all the rest of it, and many people worked um, in Nottinghamshire. They, you know, obviously it was the, there were the coal fields, there were the steel works, it was heavy industry. Um, there were, it was probably more occupational than anything else, but um, that was my normal. Yeah. But the one thing my parents did teach us very much was that whatever we did, we had to be the best that we could be. And again, not atypical. So education, I think, was really important to them because they saw the value of it in terms of the way in which you could um, not only achieve your potential, but actually develop on from where you were um, and something that they hadn't had the opportunity to take advantage of. Um, am I right in saying that you were able to... to read and write? Yeah, my writing wasn't great, but um, I, could, I could read by the time I was age four. We used to get, I used to get six books a week from the library and they'd all be read and then, you know, go just work my way through all the books. Um, and when I went to secondary, just before I went to secondary school, I think we, I was the last year, this, so this was 1974 going to 75, we were the last year that did the 11 plus exam. Now, I didn't know I was doing the 11 plus exam. I just went to school and they said, you've got, you've got to sit a test. Oh, okay. So we sat, we sat this test and I did the test. Um, and then a letter came to the house saying that I'd passed the 11 plus and I'd got a place at the girls' grammar school, which I was horrified at because one, I didn't want to go to the girls' grammar school. I wanted to go to, you know, the, the usual, the, um, what did they call it? The secondary modern school that my brothers had gone to. And then luckily for me, in 1975, during the summer holidays, um, Nottingham moved to an all comprehensive system. So the grammar school I was supposed to go to, um, which was a, a Catholic grammar school, it, it amalgamated with the Catholic secondary modern school and became a new school. So I was able to go to that school. So I was really pleased about that. When I got to the school, we were all put in, there were six classes, we were all put into different classes you know, randomly. Retrospectively now I realise I was put into a remedial class and it was after a bit they realised I was in the wrong class and they moved me up, even though I had actually passed the 11 plus. And as we'll see, and as you far more eloquently than I can say, often your story is told for you and often yes. people will look at you and make assumptions mm -hmm. about who you are and where you came from. Looking back, do you feel this was an early instance of that? 
Yes, I think that, again, when I, looking at it now as an adult, what, the other things I notice about, I remember um, about the class was that, um, as I said, no one else had taken a test apart from me, and maybe others did, but I didn't know about that. Um, also, my best friend who, who I was sitting next to was Ukrainian, and in that class were almost the same profile as where I'd been brought up. So it was very much more ethnically mixed in the lower classes. The other thing that I noticed much more was that um, the things that I took, that I took to be normal were not normal in a bigger, in a bigger sense of the world. Well, going to secondary school was the first time that I actually was able to be with people who were not like me. And I, I don't mean just in terms of, uh, uh, in racially, but in terms of e economy. So economically, yes. they, were, they were different. So I saw a greater range of, um, of money, of privilege, of all things, which I had never seen because in my little world, we were all equally in the same space. With so many of my guests, bullying is a feature of their lives mm -hmm. to, to a larger or greater extent. And in a, in a strange way, it also touched yours, but perhaps in a different way where you weren't so much the recipient of bullying, but you felt a need where you saw injustice yeah. or bullying to step forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I cannot say I was bullied at school because I wasn't, I wasn't bullied at school. I, I think I, there, were, there were things that made it fortunate for me. One was that there was quite a mixture of different um, ethnic groups in, in my school. That was one thing. But I think because I was good at school, that, was, that helps. Um, and also I was very good at sport. So you kind of, you know, um, people who might have been really clever in the school thing weren't necessarily the best at sports, so might have got teased about the sport, but I actually was good at sports as well. So I kind of managed to walk the line between the two relatively, relatively well. Um, but for a lot of my friends and, and my, my best friend, you know, were, was bullied at school and, um, I always felt like I had to, I had a compulsion to say something and to, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't just stay silent. It just wasn't in me to do it. And I don't know why, but it just wasn't in me to do it. And if, if there's one thing that still kind of gets my hackles raised, it's why it's injustice and inequity and injustice are the key things for me. And in those early years, with the background of seeing sick people around you, which was a normal context for you growing up, the fact that you were exceptional in terms of your studies, clearly studious. What were some of your aspirations in terms of career? Well, very early on, I wanted to be a doctor, a medical doctor, <laughs> not the kind of doctor I am right now. I wanted to be a medical doctor because, and I wanted to be a GP. I wanted to be a doctor that would help people not have, I remember saying to my mum, I I, you know, if, if, how can Miss so-and-so not have this cough? She's going, well, it depends on, you know, your health and all this, and you need some, you know, you need, the doctors help you to get better. And I thought, oh, well, that's what I want to do, help people not have a cough and help people get better. This is way back in the beginning of the 80s, right at the beginning of 1981, this was. And at that time, sometimes you had an interview and sometimes you didn't. Sometimes you got offered a place and then you were offered an open day afterwards to orientate and that's what happened to me and as we were going around with the two medical students and they were telling us about you know being a student and telling us about um, medicine and all the rest of it the whole conversation was around working in hospital there was no conversation about not working in hospital and the thing that struck me most was that all they talked about was becoming a consultant um, and this is no disrespect to our medical colleagues but that's all they talked about becoming a consultant and when you do that then you don't have to be on call and you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that obviously not like now this was the 80s um and the more they talked the more i thought Damn, that's not what i want to do that's not what i want to do that's not where i want to influence people and i i i got more uncomfortable the longer i was there and i was sat next to the, the one of the students and this male student he said to me uh, where do you where do you go to which school did you go to and I said oh I go to Trinity Comprehensive School and he said comprehensive school and I said yes and he leaned forward past looking past the three of us in the middle to his colleague at the other end and said she goes to a comprehensive and all of them looked at me and they went wow you've done well haven't you to me and I went I've done all right and I thought oh 
these are definitely not my people. So I got up and they say, we sat there and they were all sat in silence just looking at me. And then, and then, one, and then just before we went in, the, one of my other um, uh, candidates said to me, so what do your mum and dad do then? And I said, what do your mum and dad do? And they said, oh, my mum's a doctor and my dad's a doctor. Oh, my mum's a teacher and my dad's a doctor. And they, I went, oh. And I said, well, my mum's a domestic and my dad drives a forklift truck. And they both looked at me again and went, wow. Anyway, at that point, I was called into the room. And I went into the room, and it was <laughs> quite similar to where we're sitting. It was a large room, though, oak panelled, like it's dark, and there was a table in the middle. Um, and there were about five people, I think, five or six people sat on the other side of the table. And there was one chair in the middle of the floor, um, sat in the chair. And the, 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 the person who was chairing, I don't know, you know what, his, what his rank was, um, said to me, you know, welcome. And he said, oh, um, you know, we're, we're really impressed with your predicted grades and your academic profile. And I went, yeah, right. And he said, you've done very, very well, haven't you? And I said, yes. And I just said, I don't think I really want to do this now. And not all of them just were completely sad. And I said, I don't really think this is what I want to do. I don't think, that, but you, you would be very good, they said. I said, yeah, I know, but I don't think you're my kind of people. And I said, I think I should go now. And I stood up and I walked to the door. And as I got to the door, the, um, you know, the, the gentleman about thing said to me, he called me and he said, and he said um, I can hear him clearly saying to me, Miss Serrant. And I turned around and he said, just remember when you walk out of that door, you could have been a doctor. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your nursing career training? It was a four year degree. Um, and when we were in the first years, there was only a second year, if you know what I mean. So that's kind of where, where we started. There were 30 of us in the class. Um, I was the only black student. Um, made some really good friends who are still friends now in, in there. And I remember um, I really enjoyed the academic bits of the work and I was really looking forward to doing the, the hand, you know, getting my hands on some patients as you do, um, the hands on care. And I remember going on the ward and it was the old Nightingale wards, you know, so the very long wards with the beds down each side and the nurses station at one end. And one of the first things we had to do was to do all, we, we had to do all the beds and then help all the patients have a bed bath and then get them ready for the consultant's ward round. That was the first job always. And then we went to go and help the gentleman go into the bed and I got the bowl of water sat it on the table and said, oh, I've come to help you. And he just said, no. And I said, oh, uh, can you do it yourself? And he said, no, I need some help. And I said, oh, well, I'm here to help you. And he said, no, I don't want you to touch me. And I said, is there a problem? You know, what, what's happened? And I'm looking at this third year student. She's looking at me and he said, he said to her, you can touch me, but she can't touch me. And I didn't know what to say. And she said, well, she said, what, what's the problem? And he said, her hands aren't clean. I said, no, I've just washed my hands. I'll wash them again. He goes, no, your hands are black. They're never clean. And I stood there for a moment and the third year student just looked at me and then she went, I'll go and get sister. So I just stood there. I didn't know what to say. Um, and then she went and got the sister and the sister came and said, what's the problem? What's the problem? And I said, oh, um, this gentleman won't let me wash, wash him. And she said, why not? And, and he said, well, I don't want that black nurse to touch me or my bed. I'm, I'm not having it kind of thing. And the sister said to me, um, oh, uh, it's all right, Laura. Well, she didn't say Laura, she said, it's all right, student nurse, Sarah. And she said, um, you just go into the sluice and I'll sort something out. So I went into the sluice and started cleaning the bed pans. And I stayed there the whole shift. And she came back into the sluice and she just said, um, oh, don't worry about him. She said, um, you know, he's, he's, he doesn't know what we're doing. We'll start again tomorrow, but you just stay here because that's probably best. And so I spent the whole of my first shift cleaning bedpans in the, in the sluice. The second day, I was ready and very nervous about it. We went back onto the wards, back to do the same shift. And I went out with the, with the, with the bed sheets as I did before with a different uh, student nurse we stripped the bed we got to the first and I thought I'm not going to call the sister today I'm going to deal with it 
went to the first bed and we'd got the other side of the ward this time, went to the first bed and the first patient said, I don't want you to help me. And I said, okay. So I said to this, this, the other student, will you help her? I'll go to the next person. And I went to six people before somebody would let me help them. And on the seventh person, I was like, I've had enough of this. I, was, I didn't know whether to be angry, upset or whatever, but I was just determined that I was going to do my job. I did not want to spend another day in the sluice. On the seventh person, the student I was with went and said, I'm going to get sister. And sister cook came out and said, what's going on? She's German, sister cook, very robust and, you know, very much like matron. She was very, very, and everybody was terrified of her. And she came on and she said, what's going on? What's going on? And I said, oh, I'm just helping this, this, this lady to get changed. And she said, what about the other six people? And I said, well, they didn't want me to help them. And she just said, right. And she said, come on, staff nurse. She says, come on, student nurse. And you can do this. And she just washed. We went to the next person, the next person. I don't know. And she went, this nurse is perfectly able to provide the care you need. We don't get to choose who we have. We just, we're giving care. She's here to help you. And she goes, and I will make sure that everything is done correctly. And she stood by the bed while I did the washing, the changing with the other student and whatever. And we finished. She said, right, carry on. And we got to the end of our side. And then afterwards, she said, when you get to the end, I want you to come back into my office. And I went back in her office at the end. And she just said to me, never, ever let anybody tell you that you cannot give them care. Never tell, never let them tell you you're not good enough. You're absolutely good enough to do this job. And I went, yes, sister. And then that was it. And she was just, and she just said, now go ahead. And that was, and that was probably a really good example for me of two ways of dealing with the same situation. Both of them are come from care. I mean, the, the, the sister who didn't deal with it, who actually put me in the sluice, felt that she was safeguarding me from that kind of racist response. But actually, what happened was that she actually made me feel worse. And can you tell me in all of its wonderful detail, you've had many giants in your life. Can you tell us about Joe? Um, he was an ex-miner. He'd got a very chronic lung disease from, um, you know, from obviously working in the mines. Um, he could hardly breathe. He was so pale. I'd never seen somebody so pale. And he, he'd got very little um, breath. He couldn't take a deep breath. So he whispered and he spoke like this all the time. And every breath you could see was laboured and that's how he spoke. And he was, a, you know, a roughy tufty miner and he was the gentlest person I've probably ever met. I remember going into the side ward, there was him and his wife was sat next to him and he was terminally ill. And I was going into the side ward and I was asking him, oh, is it okay if I can help you? And he said, yes. He could just nod, he said yes. He, he was persuade his wife to go and have a break because she was sitting there 24 seven. And uh, she'd say, he'd say, it's okay, Laura's here. And I'd sit by him and half the time he didn't speak and I just listened to him breathing and whatever. And I remember he was the other person who said to me, you're a good nurse. And I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. And I was really, you know, and I was scared because I'd never seen someone die. I'd seen plenty of people who were dead. You know, obviously in the Caribbean, seeing a dead body was not you know, in a, in a funeral, open caskets was not a strain, but I'd never seen anybody through that journey. And he was just very patient and very quiet. And he used to talk to me. And when I'd had that day, I looked after Joe for the first time, the day after I'd had, in the afternoon after I'd done the bed baths, when I'd had the experience of being rejected. Um, and he just patted me on the arm and just said, you're a good nurse. And he said, don't let them get to you. Don't let them get you down. You're doing good things here. And I went off and a couple of days later, he died. And I just remember him um, and he absolutely, I can see him as clear as day. And that was what, I was, I was 18 um, and I'm almost 58 now. So that was uh, 40 years ago. But I remember him clear as day, making me feel that what I was doing was absolutely important and absolutely essential. And his wife wrote me a card after he died and and sent it to the ward for me. And he just said, 
thank you. Joe says thank you. And that was priceless. You also represent for me the many voices that we either do not hear or we choose to ignore. And for anyone who listens to this, to listen to other voices and, and says, well, you're just an anomaly. But we've heard repeatedly again and again and again these moments where either assumptions are made about you or, as, as you have so rightly put it, your story is told for you. Mm. You were blessed to have uh, children and, again, one of the instances of assumptions being made or perhaps poor knowledge yeah. occurred. Could you tell us about that? I think probably a mixture of the two. Mm. Um, when I had my, my second son was born, um, he had um, what we would call Mongolian blue spot. He'd got birthmarks, so dark marks down his spine. He'd got um, one kind of on his head, but mainly down his spine and across his back. And I knew that that's what it was. Um, and um, the health visitor and the, came to visit me. It was a, a young health visitor came to visit me with the, and the midwife. And they came to look at my son. He was not, not long, not that many uh, weeks, days old, and to weigh him, etc. And she asked me how I was getting on as a new mother. Yeah, everything's fine. It was my second child. Um, he was weighed. I knew his weight was fine in the right percentiles, um, et cetera. She checked him over and um, then she said, oh, um, I'm going to probably come back later and have a look at, look at him again, but, you know, just make sure everything's okay. And I said, absolutely, everything's fine. Yeah, yeah no problem. You know, I, I wasn't concerned. He was feeding, he was gaining weight, no problems at all. And then um, in the, that was in the morning. And in the afternoon, she came back with a more, an older um, colleague and the older colleague said, um, is it all right if we just check your baby again? And I said, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, no, no problem at all. And then um, one of them said to me, uh, the younger one said to me, um, we're just a little concerned about how you're coping. And I said, oh, I'm coping fine. Why? What's the problem? They said, we're concerned about some of the marks on your child, um, the bruising. And I said, he hasn't got any bruising. And she said, yeah, he's got this bruising down his back. Can you tell me how that occurred? And I looked and I said, that's a birthmark. I said, it's called Mongolian blue spot. I said, the only reason you can see it is because his skin is light. And they both looked at me and they said, oh, um, well, we'll check it out and come back to you. But we may have to, you know, look into this further. I said, feel, per feel free to do so. Anyway, went away and came back and they said, oh, it, um, it appears that you're right. Um, it's OK, there's nothing to worry about. And I said, fine, I wasn't worried in the first place. And that was okay for me. But what struck me was, there I was, I was 34 um, when, I had my, um, when I had my son. And I thought to myself, hmm, what if I'd been 17? What if I'd been a single parent? What if I'd not had a nursing qualification? What if I had not known the answer to the question before they asked it? Before I'd known it, I would have had social services, there'd been non-accidental injury, there'd have been all things for me to prove that I wasn't mistreating my child. Now, I don't have any, um, I don't bear any malice towards the, t the, the nurse and the midwife and the health visitor that I saw, because they were doing their, their job. Because if it had been non-accidental injury, absolutely, they did exactly the right thing. But for me, that was, it wasn't about them, it was about understanding the health and the diversity and the importance of health, how health presents itself in people from all different colours, creeds and communities. Um, there's much joy in your journey mm -hmm. and we've already heard about one of your giants, uh, Joe. Can you tell me about Professor Elizabeth Annie Onwu? Yes, definitely. Dame Professor Elizabeth Annie Onwu. Um, she is my absolute number one giant. Um, she was one of my first mentors, and now happily I can call a friend. I've known her for many, many years. She was the nurse who insisted and ensured that we had sickle cell listed in, the, in our nursing text as actually a condition. Not that it didn't exist, but it wasn't actually listed. As I say, she mentored me quite early on, and she also was somebody else who said to me, don't let them tell you you're not good enough. Just she pushed me to fight and to stand. And it's because of her that I actually spoke out loud.
So all the things I tell you about, I felt this and I stood up for people, they were one-to-one -one personal experiences. When I met Elizabeth Anionwu, she drove me to actually stand up and she was the one that constantly said to me, if you don't stand up and speak, who else is gonna do it? You have said that in no other place have I ever seen the inhumanity of person to person as in AIDS care working in mm. the 80s and 90s. Yeah. On the news, it was constant. There was like a, so, like a backlash against anyone who they thought might have AIDS. And one of the things that struck me most was um, that the five risk groups ahead of time included um, people from Africa and African origin. And I had the opportunity, I applied to work in the community. That was my first community-based role um, as a nurse and outreach worker working around it with HIV and AIDS. Um, and it was a drop-in, you'd get free condoms, we'd give safer sex advice, we'd do a hep B clinic, we'd do pregnancy tests, etc. And we had a point where we had to meet two streets down together before we could walk in because people would petition outside, outside the, the, um, the office, you know, the, the clinic, because we were working with people with AIDS. We'd get people who phoned up anonymously, you know, gave you abuse down the phone because you're working with people who, who, who were living with HIV. Um, you know, it was, it was horrific. You know, I suppose even recent pandemics, I see elements of that. There are elements of something that happens during a pandemic where fear and um, fear and disease come together that creates a level of hysteria that, that is quite hard to kind of fathom, really. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and, and I hope you'll forgive me for making parallels that may or may not exist, but there seems to me a clear parallel between uh, your work here and the, the way that you were seen in your childhood in you could not accept social no. injustice and no. inequality. I can't. I can't. It's, you know, I wish I could sometimes because it would make life a lot easier. But no, I can't. I cannot. I cannot. I, I need to feel that I'm doing something to make it better, even for a small group of people. And that's, that's probably what, what eventually drove me to become more and more involved around policy. Because what I realise is that as one person, I can make a difference to you or to this group or to this family, or I can make a contribution. But actually policy and governance, and that's where it drives from, because that's what enables us to make a difference to a lot larger group of people. So the first policy, I mean, with my, working around HIV and AIDS, the first policy that I um, worked with, was part of developing, was the first HIV strategy for England, which, was in t which came out in 2001. And that came from reading more and more things and thinking, it's all right me reading all these things, the journals, the articles, the papers, but working every day in AIDS care, that's not the experience I saw every single day. And again, I thought to myself, well, somebody else must have noticed it can't be just down to me. And that's what made me get involved in it because I thought the stories you are telling it's not the whole story. You, you know, all the people I work with, they are completely missing from the stories you're telling about this disease. I have very purposefully not spoken about your many academic achievements because I myself am looking for the stories that come in between. Mm -hmm. um, and as we conclude today, may I have the privilege of hearing what is it that silence sounds like for you? I talk about silence and the hashtag I use is silence speaks because I use that to reflect the importance of hearing the stories behind the data. I use it to reflect the fact that when you know my data, when you look at my statistics and you look at, you know, you read my CV or whatever you do, okay, or you see me as a black female nurse academic when you meet me, that's the least you know about me. Because the stories, the silent bits, the things you don't know are where my superpower lies and that's where my contribution lies and that's what makes me uniquely me. So I often ask people to be quiet and to listen and answer the question, what does silence sound like to you? My silence sounds like this. 
When I hear my own silence, my silence sounds like walking into a room and scanning it to see if anybody looks like me. My silence sounds like feeling the eyes of the few black students in the room looking at me and locking eyes with them for a moment, which tells them that I see them. My silence sounds like being the only person in a first class carriage who's asked by the conductor to show their ticket to prove that they should be there. My silence sounds like sitting in a room with my colleagues and my peers and when race and racism is mentioned, being conscious of the fact that none of them are looking at me. My silence sounds like being asked, are you sure you're in the right place? Have you got your ID badge? My silence sounds like hearing student nurses recount a patient refusing them looking after them because they're black. My silence sounds like giving that little nod to the other minority person in the room as a sign of recognition and that little smile we give each other. My silence sounds like going to a place and being visible all the time. My silence sounds like seeing the cleaners and the domestics and the security and see my parents looking back at me. My silence sounds like feeling that joy at graduation every single time a student crosses that threshold and looks at me and nods. My silence sounds like walking into a room and feeling tired. My silence sounds like taking a deep breath, flexing my shoulders and starting again. And my silence sounds like hearing my story, my family's story, my community story, our story, mistold again and again and again. Thank you so, so much, Professor Laura Serrano.